name Walter Dixon, who's a, a major player in this, not always in the best way. Uh, one of the key things that happened, Walter Dixon, as, as Bertie mentioned, he was um, uh, Washington, he's actually a Washington area, a Baltimore, Washington area a dealer of a number of different cars. And he, um, in an early meeting with Frank Nichols, suggested to him that, you, know, you ever thought of something like an MGA? MGAs were quite popular at the time, very successful car. And, um, and that uh, you might want to, um, you, you might want to consider building something like an MGA. And uh, Frank thought that was a really good idea. And that went into, that's what became then the Courier. So the Courier was really born out of a discussion between the two, and that became the, uh, the production car that, that uh, later actually, to some extent, led to a, a temporary downfall for Elva. Continuing on with the story here, I just wanted to quickly mention that this is, I mentioned about Archie Butterworth, and there's another, another key person in, in that particular period, and that's Archie Scott Brown. As you see here on the left, that's Frank Nichols. To his right is, to his left is Archie Scott Brown. To his left is Archie Butterworth, so a tale of two Archies. Butterworth already celebrating, as you can see, and gone into the boot of his Jaguar. And I can't remember the name of the fellow, but he's the Brands Hatch manager who's on the far right, the young fellow. Archie Scott Brown was one of the real iconic English drivers of that era. And he was, as far as the Elva saga goes, he drove several Elvas, of the Mark, particular Mark III's. And, uh, and he was also one of the few who could drive this Butterworth engine car. Archie was born with only a stub of one one hand, one hand was left hand was was fine, the right hand was just a stub, and yet drove in a, a year long before political correctness and all that. He was a very successful handicapped driver, and never no, very few people even knew that that he was handicapped. It was quite a success story during that period. Um, I'll talk more here about uh, the couriers, and they'll start showing up here in the slides shortly. The Courier was, um, in some ways, was an MGA that in a, it used an MGA engine originally, later on the MGB. It was Nichols's big move into being a proper producer of road cars, and ultimately, though, these weren't really road cars. They were road cars meant for racing. Again, there was this element of no compromise. They weren't particularly comfortable for creature comforts. They're famous for the engine being located somewhat further back, so the cockpit was rather cramped. Uh, there's, there's our fr friend Bertie Martin here uh, on, on his lawn. <laughs> Good-looking good looking Bertie Martin. And uh, so the Courier was, it was a, quite a cramped car, but it had a really good advantage. The power-to-weight ratio was spectacular. And even though it was cost a little more than the cars, the comp competing cars like the MGA, uh, like the Triumph TR3, it became quite popular among people who wanted this kind of no-nonsense race car, something they could drive to the track, race, and drive home in the production categories. In many ways, the design of the Courier presaged the Spitfire that the... Um, if you, many, in fact, somebody who came up to me this morning and said, yes, a friend of mine sent me this photo. He says, oh, look at this interesting Spitfire that ran at Vineland in New Jersey. But it wasn't a Spitfire. It was a Courier. They were often mistaken for that. When the Courier came online, there was a kind of a problem with Elva because they weren't really equipped. Remember, they were just drawing chalk lines on the floor. Now they actually had to do actual drawings. And they had to move to a bigger facility. It was no longer, they were behind a fish and chips shop initially. And... They had to move to a bigger facility. Initially, they moved to kind of an interim facility in a drill hall that was rented out. Eventually moved to Hastings itself. I mentioned that's where the Battle of Hastings took place. Later on, they would move to uh, the uh, production would move on to Croydon near to London and be taken over by a company called Trojan. There was always kind of a, Frank Nichols had, I think, kind of an ambivalent relationship with the courier. He would had hoped that they would be a cash cow. They never turned out that way. And 
he never really wanted, I mean, he expected people to race them, but wasn't really there to support the racing activity. This is a period now, 1959 to 61, that the Courier was built. And it was a period, so it was a period of rapid growth for Elva. Um, the Couriers themselves were built on later on, 62, 65, in different stages. And they were raced really for many years after that. In fact, uh, as recently as 2002, a Courier won the e-production national championship with SECA. The, one of the key things about the Courier is that are some of the drivers involved. And we talked earlier about drivers such as Chuck Dietrich. There's also, I can't forget, Susie Dietrich, who was in that rare sorority of really fine women drivers that are there. Is Susie Dietrich, Denise McCluggage, uh, Pinky Rollo, Donna Mae Mims, a few others of that era were very good. Uh, Margaret Wiley would be another one. Her husband, Doc Wiley, was also a major Elva driver of that era. But now we're, we're moving on to the Courier, the Courier also was a great starting point for a number of drivers. People like John Quartz, John Cannon, Peter Revson got their start. Jim Downing, who became a big, uh, more recently in, in IMSA racing, got a start with the Courier. John Osteen, another IMSA driver much later, got a start with Courier. But nobody bigger than Mark Donahue, of course, who Michael has written quite a bit about. Mark Donahue got his start in Courier, this very kind of brutish, car, which he won a national championship with. Couriers weren't, of course, the only thing going on. In fact, this became a very, very busy time for Elva. They were producing couriers, stole the sports racers, and they would slowly, surely move into Formula Junior as well. They produced, uh, and, and Bertie touched on it, the um, later sports racers, and these became actually the last of the front engine of the sports racers, which were the Mark IV and the Mark V. This is really where Frank Nichols' passion remained, was still with the sports racers. This was, uh, the Mark IV was a first independent rear suspension car that uh, Elva built. It was actually a competitor to the Lotus 11. The Lotus 11 was, in terms of mass numbers, was the, the most common car. As Bertie mentioned, that class of racing was particularly popular in England, and the Mark IV was, to some degree, a competition with the Lotus 11. It was a more air, the Lotus or the Mark IV was a more aerodynamic version of the, of the earlier Elvas. Most of them were now fiberglass, not all of them, most of them were fiberglass. Very low built, a lot of Climax, again, mostly Climax engine, a few Alfa Romeos. Even one Buick engine, in fact, I spoke with a fellow here who uh, has that Buick, the car with the Buick engine. Bernie Keller was the original owner of that. One of the differences, though, with, with say, the Mark IV, the Elva Mark IVs and the Lotus, is that the, the Elva was always considered a true club racer. As Bertie mentioned, you had to know what you're doing with an Elva. You had to tinker with it. You had to work with it. It was meant as a club racer, not really as a stepping stone kind of car. The Mark IV was also important. That was the first car that Carl Haas really got involved with, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And as Bertie mentioned, that, uh, that that car won its class at Sebring in 1959. Second place to that car was the car driven by Bertie that was, um, I believe, co-driven with Carl Haas and was managed by none other than Tex Hopkins, also another famous f uh, figure here at Watkins Glen. Um, one of the interesting comments, I think, always about these early Elvas, as, as Bertie mentioned, that uh, they were kind of just put together. But even so, Chuck Dietrich was one that always thought that the Elvas were better than the Lotuses. Lotuses would have to be, and there's with Mark Donahue himself, Lotuses would have to be welded together between qualifying and, and the race. Elvas at least held together a little bit better than that. After the, the Mark IV came the, the Mark V, the la, very last of the, the front engines. It was even lower than the Mark IV, had arched wheels because it still retained, again, the old 15-inch wheels. One of the things was that, again, Nichols, in his conservative way, 
didn't move to the smaller wheels that were common at that time, the 13-inch wheels. As I mentioned, that there was really three different kinds of production going on here. We have these couriers that are really gearing up. We've talked about the sports racers. And then there's Formula Junior. Remember, in motorsports, there's always this kind of tension between cost and competition. You try to keep the cost down. People develop new technologies to be more competitive. The cost goes back up. So it's always this kind of battle back and forth to try to keep costs down. And there were a number of formulas already existing in the 1950s that were intended to keep costs down, but they were usually kind of basic, used motorcycle engines, Formula 500cc would be one of such classes, early Formula 3 was such. Uh, Johnny Lurani from Italy came up with this idea of the Formula Junior. Essentially, why not build cars to spec, more or less spec cars, it'd be 1,000cc cars, later 1,100cc, use production components, have them as single-seater races, single-seater cars, have the races and a kind of a national championship basis, get this approved by the FIA, and spread it around the world. The, the, the idea really caught on, and from about 1959 to 63, Formula Junior was the stepping stone of motorsports in that era. Stepping stone and also a lot of club racers. It was, you could be a junior fun, Fangio or Scari or what have you in your Formula Junior. They looked like race cars. The Italian cars typically had one liter Fiats in them, were garage built around that. There were French cars with DB Panhards, there were German cars with DKW, three-cylinder, three uh, two-stroke DKWs. And then the English cars typically used BMC Austins. Nobody really jumped to the fore right away and built them in England. In fact, none of the countries had really constructors of Formula Juniors. But then Frank Nichols jumped in. And I believe some of the early conversations with that actually took place in Bernie's, Bernie's kitchen where uh, Frank saw a midget that Ed Crawford had brought over from the West Coast, a, a, a small midget racer from an amusement park. And that kind of gave Frank some ideas that later germinated in becoming the Formula Junior. He was the first, Frank Nichols, Elva was the first to produce Formula Juniors in any kind of significant quantity. And this was, it beat Cooper and Lotus. Cooper and Lotus at that time were very busy with their Formula One programs and really didn't pay much attention to Formula Junior. Also, the Formula Junior that, um, that Frank Nichols developed had an advantage when it came over to the U.S. because the U.S. caught on to Formula Junior right away. They were a little bit larger. The cockpit area was a little larger. Americans tend to be a little larger people than most Europeans. And it was very com comfortable and convenient for that. Yeah, there's, here's a, this, this is a, we'll stop here for a moment because Bertie referred to his activities with uh, the Mark IV. And here's Bertie at his driving best. I believe this is at Meadowdale, is that right? No, that was at uh, uh, Wilmot Hills. Wilmot, Wilmot Hills, Hills, okay. Yeah. Do you want to take a moment to talk about this particular yeah, incident? I, I, I will because. That was the car that Bill Jordan and I drove at uh, and, and uh, Carl at Sebring, and uh, Bill came back from Sebring and unfortunately had a heart attack, and uh, he was a bit older than I was, lawyer, and uh, uh, he told me he said, Bertie, go race my car for a while and see if you can find a buyer, and so that was a race at Wilmot that I drove it at. In fact. Uh, the interesting thing is that I was actually about two feet higher with all four wheels off the ground. There was some snapshots that weren't nearly as good as this was, but I was a good bit higher. The follow, it, during that same meeting that day, we had another race for the, this car qualified for, and uh, I ran this car in it and won that race after this thing. So it showed out how strong these cars were. And, uh, you know, you, you felt very safe in them. I've had a couple pretty good accidents in them and come away very well with it. And uh, anyhow, that was very interesting. But I do, I would like to go back to one moment. Uh, sure. Because you 
you were talking about the. Uh, mm -hmm. Again. Okay, I'm, I'm back again. Oh, there he Sooner, is again. I'm oh, this was, that was with a Mark IV, too, but that was a, my own one there. That's one I did with the, the Lolas at that time. But, uh, no, the, the thing that happened was we had a number of friends in Chicago, in the Chicago region, and Eddie Crawford lived quite close to me, and he was one of my best friends, and... Uh, we used to go over there, and it started out in his yard that he had bought. He had five acres there, and the people had raised horses and that, and so they had jumps in their yard in the, when he bought it. Well, he left them there, and we laid out a race course around those jumps in his yard. And we started out because somebody bought a Hinkle a moped and somebody else had something, and we started racing in those mopeds. And one Sunday, we were going up to Milwaukee, about six of us in the car, to a champ car race up there. And we were saying, wouldn't it be nice if we had some little cars we could race? And I said, wait a minute, I know. I saw an ad in the paper for a company that makes these things for, uh, uh, for carnivals and for uh, uh, just off-road racing. They have a little Wisconsin engine in them and so forth. And so at that moment, we said, well, who would buy one? And I said, I'll, I'll order them if you, if you, you know, get enough guys. Well, we got six guys together, and we, we ordered six of them. And we even included Wacky Arnold, who was the MG distributor in Chicago, without telling them, because we knew he'd buy anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, we bought those. And they came, and we had started racing in his yard with these things. And we had a ball with it, you know. And then we actually even went on and had the fellow who built Meadowdale, uh, Leonard Beesinger, who was a, a uh, really a housing builder at that time, and he built a, a, uh, a shopping center, and he invited us out to race at uh, his shopping center on Sundays, and he would get a great big crowd of people coming out there, and we were using up all of the motor or uh, a wheelbarrow tires that we could find and because they'd only last a couple races or that <laughs> and that's how we got into uh, that frank nichols was coming over so i took frank over to to uh, eddie's house and we had a little race there and it, frank drove one of those little cars and uh, he thought this was a lot of fun and we said frank what we need now is we need one with a shifter in it and we need a car and at that time, the van wall was, was the hot setup in Formula One, and so in Grand Prix racing. So we said, Frank, I, I said, I've got a picture of a van wall. We just want to shrink that down and have it look like a van wall. You put some kind of a motorcycle, any, any motorcycle engine that's got a five-speed gearbox or something. And uh, we don't want a big one. We want, we said, 250 and so forth. And, so he sa we said, go ahead and do this. This was kind of in the spring. Well, he started work on that car, and I remember the time he sent a letter to me and said, I was down to uh, Italy, and Johnny Lorani has this new program down there for Formula Junior. He said, I'm going to make the car a little bit bigger because then they can use it for Formula Junior also. And uh, so uh, when we got the first ones in, we said, my God, this is the biggest little car we ever saw in our life. But it was neat, and they drove nice. Junior, I still, when I said I was an owner, I still own the first one I got in there, and I still own that. It's at my son's race shop and that, and he's been going to restore it all. It's probably only run in about ten races. The major thing was I drove it in the first, at the first U.S. Grand Prix at Sebring, I drove it in the preliminary race that morning for the uh, Formula Juniors, which was the first big Formula Junior race. Carl, I shouldn't get into going further, so I'll stop right now. But the thing was, it was about that time I decided that I really wasn't going to do that much more racing. I'd just been married, and my wife was, uh, was pregnant, and uh, uh, I thought, I'll, I'll just stop for a while. And Carl was anxious, and this is something I should have talked about before, how Carl got involved. Carl was a good friend of mine. We raced together and so forth. He was driving a Porsche and so forth. And 
Carl wanted, he, he came down to, to Nassau with us one year, and we had, you know, in those days, Nassau would give you two rooms, so Al Ross and I had, were sleeping in mine. But Carl didn't have a, anybody with him, and so he had an empty bed in his room at the hotel. Frank Nichols came over. We didn't know for sure that he was coming, but Frank came over. He said, Carl, can you put up Frank in your, in your bedroom? bedroom? He said, sure. Well, they got talking at night when they were laying in the beds there talking, and Frank Nichols sold Carl a car at that time. <laughs> he had a Porsche, and he sold him a car, and Frank told him about this wonderful thing. He had been to Massachusetts, I think, to fell a Candy Pool was his name up there who had designed a four-emil carburetor manifold for the Coventry Climax engine, and he was sure that that would give you, you would end up having probably about 15, horse, 15 horsepower more than you were getting out of the stock one. Carl wanted the car like that with the candy pool manifold on it. Well, when it came, it wasn't that much faster, if it was any faster at all. But Carl had them, and that was in a Mark III body. But Carl got very interested in this thing, and he wanted to get involved in the sale of those cars. At the time, he was working for the Ford Motor Company in a, uh, uh, a training program for executive, well, not executives, a training program for middle line people. And so uh, Carl came to me, and he said, I want to get involved. I said, okay, Carl, you now work for me. You're a salesman then, and you get a commission when you sell them. We didn't make much money on the cars anyhow. We made more money really on the parts probably in those days. And uh, so Carl came. And at this time, uh, when Nichols was having a bit of a problem, he had some cars that had been ordered by a dealer whose name rhymes with Dixon. But anyhow, they were sitting on a uh, dock down in Florida. And I said, Carl, here's your first assignment. You go down there and you see if you can't sell those cars down there somewhere. And he did, and he went over, because he knew Jim Hall pretty well, he went over to Texas and he sold Jim Hall one and one of Jim's other friends, not uh, not uh, Sharp, but another fellow that he sold to the two juniors that were sitting there. And uh, so that's how Carl got involved. When he came back, I said, Carl, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out of the the sale of the cars. Why don't you just take it on? You can pay me whatever you want out of it, whatever you make something. I don't know. He did give me some money, believe it or not, but uh, we didn't. Ha it was pretty informal, but I said, I want to keep the Coventry Climax business and that. And so I did that for quite a while before I sold that part of it to him, too. So that's how Carl got involved. Any? Do we have questions later? Yeah, yeah well, what's what is it? At this point, do we learn whether your car came to be upright, your Mark IV? It landed on four <laughs> wheels. Good point. Good point. <laughs> it landed on four wheels and dove just as straight. In fact, it might have just uh, got a tune-up on it and worked better. I don't know, because I won the last race. So, anyway. Yeah, that was, a, that was a mystery to me as well. I'm, so. I'm sorry. Oh, I love it. We I didn't ever great. get enough time to really spend time to get together before. Right. Um, uh, that's great. I, I, I never knew the end, end of that story as to what happened with that car. Just said before. I know it became an ad for Johnny Walker Bur yeah, Bourbon, though. Yeah, that was in all major magazines. It was in Playboy. It was in Life magazine. <laughs> and Ron, I, I, I signed an agreement because the photographer was a young fella and he mm. needed the money and he asked if I would sign a release and I did for him. Uh. And uh, he's still a good friend of mine. Mm. Well, we've alluded to these problems with Walt Dixon, and the basically issue there is that remember you get a shoestring operation, Elva. It's uh, basically living hand to mouth. Uh, Frank Nichols has been living hand to mouth. So, for that matter, was Walt Dixon with his dealership in the D.C. area, and in fact, he started playing quite a shell game with his cars. And his deal with Nichols is he was going to prepay for this big order of couriers, but after a while, the checks weren't coming or they were bouncing. Well, the same thing was happening with, with, with uh, the creditors that, that Dixon had, that he wasn't paying them. Um, and after a while, he was doing shell games where he would, to get more loans, to get increase his loan uh, letter of credit with the bank, 
he would do these games where he would use the cars as collateral and then have his customers come back with their cars to do servicing. And then when the bank came around to make sure that the cars were actually there as inventory, there they were, but they had already been sold. So he had all sorts of ways of doing this. Well, eventually that caught up with him. And in December of 59, he was visited by a certain team of U.S. Marshals, and, and that closed the Dixon Enterprise. And that had immediate repercussions on Frank Nichols and Alva back in England. He was basically left holding the bag. He had no, this, no more income coming. And it was the worst possible time because the production was ramping up with all the couriers, Romeo Juniors, the, the, the various sports racers. And was it the end of Elva? Well, of course not. It was, uh, it was really just kind of, the, in some ways, the midpoint. Elva recovered quite qu quickly, really thanks to three different people or three different organizations. One, as we heard, Carl Haas. Carl Haas stepped to the plate and invested a lot in the restructured Elva, which is called Elva Cars, 1961 Limited. Another fellow was a, a guy named Frank Webb who ran a company called Rytune Engineering. He stepped to the plate and built some of those last of the front engine uh, Formula Junior cars that you saw. Those were called Scorpions. They were built out of the, uh, the Elva plant, but because of this liquidation process, they couldn't be called Elvas. They were somewhat different, actually, than the uh, original Elva 100s, as they were called, Formula Juniors. And then the other uh, company that came into play was Trojan. Trojan has have been around since something like 1910, involved in a variety of automotive enterprises. Most recently, at that time, was the importer of Lambretta Scooter from, from Italy. And they also, in fact, uh, were involved with a big go-karting operation in the United States, sold many, many go-karts. They took on the courier, the production of the courier. So essentially all the post-1961 couriers were actually built by Trojan, which is located in Croydon <coughs> near London. So pretty soon now, Elva's back on its feet, and they're producing cars again. They're producing another round of Formula Junior cars, and you kind of quickly saw some of those. These were the rear-engine Formula Junior cars because by that time, front engines were obsolete in Formula Junior as they were in, in Formula One. Um, the Formula Junior, the rear-engine Formula Junior is called the 200, later the 300. 200 the ones with the, that vertical fin. The 300s are the very, very low, boxy ones. These were all, and all the, the thing about all the Formula Junior cars is they came to be driven by some significant people, particularly here in the United States. Bob Bondurant drove one at one point. Uh, Charlie Kolb won a championship with the Formula Juniors. The, the later, the rear engine Formula Junior, one of those was driven by Mark Donner. He didn't have as much success with that as he did with the uh, Courier, but it was a major, major stepping stone for Donahue that carried forward later into his single-seater career. Um, it also kind of coincided with more or less a general fading of Formula Junior. Formula Junior suffered this fate of a lot of these low-cost uh, formulas. Basically, somebody had got in there and took it all over. In this case, it was Lotus, the Lotus 18. And not only was the Lotus 18 successful, more successful than Elva or anybody else, and dominated the formula, but they also brought in factory teams. Jimmy Clark, a number of others, drove... Formula Junior cars, so it really kind of defeated the very purpose of that. But this shift, now we have this shift to the rear for, for uh, Elva. Very significant, time to join the modern age, have, your car, have the engine in the rear. So there are now two things going on. The Formula Junior era was over. Trojan is taking over the, the production of the couriers. Elva, meaning Frank Nichols, Keith Marsden themselves, can focus a little more, again, what they really love, which is the single-seater, I mean, sorry, the two-seater sports racers, and now they're all rear-engine from here on out, the Mark VI being the first one. The Marks, and these are all Mark VI's. The Mark VI's, again, very often Climax engines. They were successful pretty much from the onset. One of Elva's heydays came at Boxing Day, that's the day after Christmas, in 1961, when Chris Ashmore almost defeated Graham Hill, Graham Hill's Testarossa, at Brands Hatch. 
And this is a real high point. It really made people take notice again, just like they did very early on with the Elva, the potential of the Elva. And Elva got a lot of orders as a result of that. Also, a lot of characters, again, though, endlessly stories of characters and all this. There, we'll see in the moment uh, Dan Blocker. But before Dan Blocker, there was a fellow, Tony Lanfranchi, in the UK, who was another one of these characters. He came to Frank Nichols and boldly said, I want to be the, your factory driver. And Frank Nichols said, no, I don't do that. So uh, Lanfranchi went out to the casino down the road, won a bunch of money that night, came back the next day and bought his car with all the coins and all, and went racing. It was a kind of, he had framed a lot of Tony Lanfranchi stories. He, uh, well, you know, he, uh, he had, um, at one point, the, his transporter broke. He was on his way to an international race in the UK, and his transporter broke down along the way. And so he did the only sensible thing. He pulled his Elva out of the back of the transporter and started driving to the circuit, unmuffled and all. Well, the local constabulary didn't take kindly to this, stopped him, and uh, he convinced the policeman that in, rather than book him, it would really be best interest of England in this major international race if he would receive a police escort to the race. <laughs> he did, so that's the, that shows you a kind of talking point it could be. Another character, the whole story of Elva here is, is, as you can see, Dan Blocker, I believe it's Linda Vaughn with him, and uh, Dan Blocker, of course, the Bonanza actor, who became involved with the Elva Mark VI. One of, he had a couple of Mark VI's, one of them which he put a, um, he put a um, Maserati engine into it. And in fact, both of his cars featured in this particular film, Viva Las Vegas, with, with Elvis and Anne Margaret. And uh, so we have Elvis and Elva tied together, conveniently enough. In fact, it's interesting because Blocker's Maserati engine never ran particularly well. And so for the film, they actually had these two identically painted Elvas. This one with, I believe, a Coventry Climax that was actually used in the action sequences in the film. And the other one, which was only in the garage, and you see the engine lifted out of that, which is the Maserati, which is very appropriate because that's usually the condition that that particular car was in. Another, um, another thing about Dan Blocker's team is he very often used a driver by the name of Bill Harris. Bill Harris was actually a stunt man from, um, from the Hollywood area, but you know, Dan Blocker, of course, knew him from his professional connections. And if any of you have read Sylvia Wilkinson's great book, uh, The Stainless Steel Carrot, which is pretty much mostly about John Morton, but there's this great little vignette in there about Bill Harris. And Bill Harris would organize these, these stunts for the movies, and he had this one particular stunt, and I think it might have been at Daytona, where he had to catapult the car over the rail. So he arranged this all with a catapult and put a dummy in the car and all that and had this, uh, the film crew ready and the car got vaulted over the, the rail. And then he went out in his pickup truck to go retrieve this car. Well, as he went out the, to outside the track, he noticed that a crowd had kind of gathered around of civilians from driving around the area. They thought that, oh, you know, here's this terrible racing accident that just has happened. And of course, Bill Harris saw kind of figured out what's going on here. He runs up to this car that's crashed, pulls out this lifeless driver, and starts punching this. Says, you dirty so-and-so, look what you did to my race car. So, so there, all, the, all these characters, this, this particular album, Mark VI, that you see here, there's not, nothing particularly significant historically about this. It was actually driven in a series in the Midwest, Midwestern Council Sports Car Clubs. You might have noticed in some of these shots, it has kind of a, almost a Ferrari-esque kind of, of, of um, remod, rebodying to it. And um, that was designed by these two brothers, Dave and Dean Causey, in the late 1960s. And the Causeys were known for, they jumped into the big doom buggy craze that was going on at that period, wanted to make a, make a lot of money on doom buggies. Um, so they built a bunch of dune buggies. The only problem is that their source of the chassis for these dune buggies were stolen VW Beetles. They just go out on the street, steal VW Beetles, convert them into dune buggies, and sell them. Uh, they quickly uh, graduated into manufacturing license plates after that, so that they, that was a short... Uh, I, I love these particular sequence of shots because this is now the Courier Mark's 
marks three and four that were built by Trojan. And it shows you some of the advertising that was used. Don't ask me why they did this particular pose. But there are all these, these shots. There are also, I think some, maybe some shots I don't have in there of bathing beauties in, in, in the English winter uh, posed on, on some of these cars. As you can see, couriers, there are also some, not all the couriers were roadsters. Couriers had a very unique, this reverse rake coupe that they developed. Very few of those were built, and they are among the most sought after cars right now in, in the kind of collector, the courier collector market. The, um, the, there are also a number of the courier, there were, although the courier line, the courier line, by the way, is very similar in many ways to the sports racer line. Virtually no two cars are alike. Here's what I mean about the, the not, not quite the Italian Riviera. The, um, the couriers were also somewhat similar in concept to the sports racers that virtually no two were alike. There were constant variations of the suspension types. So there were two plus two seating arrangements. There were the coupes. There were the roadsters. All these constant variants because they're never quite sure, is this a road car, is this a race car, is it primarily a road car, primarily a race car? Nobody ever quite came to grips with that, which was actually, in many ways, it's, it's failing, if you might say. And, um, and in fact, it's something that frustrated Carl Haas later, because he was the principal importer of the couriers to the U.S., and he was really frustrated by this idea that it was constantly switching back and forth. There was one last courier that was kind of a... a an interesting story that this is a Le Mans courier coupe. There was two American expats in France, one military, one non-military, who raced couriers um, with each other, and they had a really good time. And over uh, some Van Rouge one night, they decided they're going to they were going to enter Le Mans. Ron Lutz and Dick Osteen, and they hatched this idea over napkins. But this one sort of worked, unlike most napkin hatched ideas that we have. They ordered a car from, well, at that point, Peter Ag from Trojan. Came as more or less a bag of bits. They got a local technical college to put it all together. They um, found when they got to Lamar that the uh, windscreen cracked right away. They got a Renault windscreen to replace it. The problem then still was that the windshield wipers wouldn't even touch the screen, but they, they kind of solved these things one by one. They also had the kind of interesting things that went on that day that they had a problem with a bad shimmy in the, um, in the, in the alignment. So they took it to a local shop that was just kind of the beginnings of electronic alignment for, for wheels. It didn't help at all. And there's this guy in the next paddock stall over heard all this going on and said, I think I can fix it as a Dunlop technician, I think. He just kind of picked up the wheel, put it on a stand, rolled it, took a weight off here, put a weight on there gave it back to them. They expected the worst, and the car handled br brilliantly after that. The, um, they still failed. They still didn't, didn't make the start, and it was kind of the last, one of the last times that, that um, Elva tried to run at Le Mans. The last of the, um, the rear engine or kind of rear engine series that were pure Elvas were the Mark 7s and the Mark 8s. And they, these were now thoroughly modern cars at this point. They were much more professional. They were lightweight, very, very lightweight. They were really designed from scratch as rear engine cars, whereas the Mark VI was more or less a, a front engine car turned around. They were dealt with actually problems such as grip and the like, which, which uh, was a new concept at that time. They were... They still use primarily Climax and Ford engines. In fact, it's interesting because later on in the history of many of these cars, they got had Hondas, Datsun, VWs installed in them. But what really became interesting is when the 7s became the Mark 7Ss, this is about 1963 or so. They brought on, uh, again, there was an engine supply issue. So Mickels at that point opted for BMW engines. The BMW, which is not yet a household name in the U.S., was, um, was considered to be a very reliable, very easy to fit in the car. It was quite, uh, quite easy to 
reconfigure the car for the, uh, the BMW engine. It was a two-liter dry sump engine that they used. Tony Lanfranchi again comes into play. He was a champion with this particular BMW engine here. The BMW engine also is about that same time that Ali Schmidt, who was the Porsche importer to the U.S., watched an Elva race at Puerto Rico along with Jushka von Hanstein of Porsche. They were quite impressed by that. They thought, hmm, maybe we should adopt some of these concepts to the Porsche because at that time the Porsche Spiders, the sports racing Spiders, were a little long in the tooth. They were reliable, but they were heavy, and uh, they were not doing particularly well. So they took this idea actually back to Ferry Porsche about maybe doing something together with Elva. Porsche was always very conservative about anybody using any other constructor using their engines. But they thought, well, maybe this is a good idea. And thus was born the Elva Porsche. The Elva Porsche became actually was the sort of the last great highlight of Elva history was came with the Elva Porsche. Uh, it was developed partly by Herbert Linga, the very famous Porsche test driver, helped a lot in setting this up. There was a lot of reconfiguring of the, the chassis that had to go on to fit a Porsche engine into it. And it was brought over in August of 1963 to the U.S. just in time for the Road America 500, which at that stage was one of the major endurance races in the U.S. And it was now waged against big war cars, Cobras, Ferraris, and the like were running in this race. Bill Wiesthoff, great American driver from the Midwest, started the race. Frank Nichols was there, one of his many, but still sporadic visits to the U.S. And um, immediately, this was a, this was a success from the start of the race, actually from qualifying on on. It was fast, and more importantly, it was very, very fuel efficient. There was a problem with a co-driver. They didn't have a co-driver nominee. Carl Haas at one point was going to drive, but he and Westhoff are so different in physical size that he didn't really, Carl didn't quite fit in the car. So uh, they ended up at the end of the day deciding on Augie Paps as a co-driver. Augie had never driven the car before. He stepped out of Roger Penske's Ferrari and when Bill Wiesthoff came in halfway through the race in the lead, handed the car over to Augie. Augie had never driven the car before, spun off at the first lap, slowly gained confidence and ended up winning the race. It was one of the great moments of Elva the, two, the first big two-liter win for a car in a major endurance race like that, and it was a win for Elva, immediately led to a long, large order of Porsche, Elva Porsches. And it's actually in, interesting because in terms of Porsche history, it's maybe the only non-Porsche-built chassis that is accepted as a Porsche. And, it, and that the lessons that Porsche learned from that were put to use later on when they built the 908, the other space frame Porsches, the 908, the 917s, and the like. The kind of last of the true Elvas, as it were, was the GT160. And this is a very special, well, not one-off, but three-off, built on a Mark 7S chassis but with a coupe body, a very nicely styled coupe body, designed by a guy, depending, you could call him two names, either Trevor Frost or Trevor Fiore. He just thought that Trevor Fiore di Torino sounds better than Trevor Frost of Leighton Buzzard. And so he just went with this kind of Italianate name that he created and designed this car called the GT160, of which only three were built. And again, in sort of typical fashion for small constructors of this type, um, they misjudged some of the calculations on the weights, they misjudged some of the calculations on cost, and as a result, the car never went into production. All three of those cars do survive. One of them went on and raced at Le Mans the following year, not with a whole lot of success, but it was always a very attractive car. The McLaren story, I mean, the Elvis story doesn't quite end there because it really ends with McLaren. Bruce McLaren, when he first was thinking about starting his own race team and was actually thinking of constructing sports racers, thought, 
well, I can construct the basic idea, but I can't make customer cars. So he came to the group now led by Peter Ag, which was the, um, the, was the uh, CEO of, of Trojan, and asked them and worked out an arrangement with them to build the original McLarens, which became known as the McLaren Alvas, the M1A. At a time, this is now 65, 66, when Group 7 racing, big bore sports racing is becoming popular, not just in the U.S., but also in Europe, build a series of 25 customer cars for me, for McLaren saying, and this became sort of the last of the real, the real story of McLaren, of Alva kind of ends there with the McLaren Alva. There were a series of other McLaren Alvas built that usually never were called McLaren Alvas, usually only went by the name of McLaren. They were the kind of the last chapter of the, of the Alva story. Alva does live on in a number of different ways. Frank Nichols himself went on and part, became part of a car, partnership with Len Terry and Carl Haas called uh, Transatlantic Consultants. They helped develop some of the BRMs of the late 1960s, the Twin Cobra in the late 1960s. So he, he kept his hand in with other automotive concerns, although later he really moved into boat building built uh, boats that were used for various rescue and fishing services in Britain. Um, he became very, uh, Nichols became very active in sort of the next phase of Elva, which was its afterlife, if you will, that Elva became and remains today one of the most popular cars in vintage and historic racing. One of the nice things about most of the Elvas that you've seen in this, is almost all of these still exist. Very few were destroyed. Almost all still exist and almost all can be found in vintage racing in one kind or another. One of the first people who really stoked this flame was Sterling Moss. Sterling Moss's first vintage racing car when he got into the, got back in the sport in the 1980s was indeed an Alva Mark 7S. And he today, to this day, remains a real champion of, of Alva and the history of Alva, which is one of the reasons he wrote the foreword to the book. Another key player in this kind of late stage of Alva we mentioned at the beginning, was Roger Dunbar. Roger Dunbar owns the Elva name, supplies the spares, as many of you who deal with Elvas know. He's actually involved in the project in bringing Elva back again, the re recreation of Elva, and a brand new Elva courier. Um, remains to be seen if that's going to be done, if the investment is there, all for it. Roger is also involved in restoring. He restored a, a Mark II recently that now resides in the museum at Bexhill. But if you were to go over to that McLaren sitting over in the lobby in the, in the research center, there might, if you look at the cellular level, there might be a little bit of the DNA of a little shop that began behind a hotel, began the fish and chip shop, there were the chalk lines on the floor. That McLaren in there, its origins do date back to this, the shop in Bexhill on Sea. So with that, thank you very much. What a wonderful presentation, led by Jan Osh and augmented by Bertie. What a treat for all of us. And Jan Osh is such a pro. He brought it in right on time because we wanted to break at 3 o'clock. We are going to do some Q&A, but before we do the Q&A, we're going to bring Bertie up for that as well. A couple of announcements. And... Uh, the first one is going to come from our friend Randy Cook, and this is special for the Elva owners because Randy's going to kind of give you a final briefing on what's needed to uh, facilitate getting to the track. Randy, would you step up? I know the uh, inclement weather has, has caused some problems here, but um, if you want to take your, track to, or your car to the track today, it's got to go within the next few minutes. <coughs> However, it's not necessary that you take it today. You can still take it up there in the morning. So if anybody wants to take their car up to the track now, meet me outside here and, uh, and we'll start that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Uh, we're going to conclude with the Q&A, but first I do want to say a couple of things. That uh, back at the Research Center are Janos's books. And this is, this is a book, when it goes out of print, it'll be gone. It'll become a collector's item. We've got the author here. It's a chance to ha have a really precious thing. I recommend it. 
Uh, we, have, we have other books for sale over there as well. We have a lot of memorabilia, and anything you buy over there benefits the research center. There are a lot of other ways to support the center. We have a sponsorship drive. We'd like to have you part of that. You can be part of that for as little as $25, and there are all kinds of levels. Uh, so we really appreciate you all being here, and we hope that, uh, that in some way you'll see fit to support the center as you are supporting it just by your presence. I also want to mention again Bill Milliken. Bill is, um, uh, well, I think it's two days gone now, but he's 101 years old. He's a big part of the, not only the Watkins gun story, but American motoring in general. A terrific driver, an absolute adventurer, a guy who always pushed the envelope, a totally in demand engineer by his books are on the shelf of every Formula One constructor in the world and they are used. He's, he's a many-faceted uh, many man, and we're so lucky to have him with us at age 101. Uh, and we're going to have a – Bill couldn't make it this time, but we have a cake back there for everybody to enjoy and some other goodies, things to drink. So when we get back to the center, enjoy – think about Bill, uh, enjoy the center, and uh, buy Janusz's book. Uh, that's, uh, that's it for announcements. Bertie, would you come up? We're going to take – for a few more minutes – we're going to take a few questions and answers, and uh, I will, uh, by the way, that wonderful photo of Bertie up on two wheels is by Ron Nelson, who has been a big supporter here of the Research Center, so I wanted to get his name in there. But Bertie, could, I'll, I'll start it out. Uh, how did you, um, how did you uh, manage to get along with, at simultaneously with Bernie Ecclestone, Jean-Pierre Blessed, Max Mosley? Colin Chapman, and all the other uh, renegades of motorsports? That's a good question. I'm not sure how I did it myself, but I like people. And, and that's one of the reasons I like Elva, because Elva had the nicest people to work with. And it was always fun to have a guy call, and that was the problem. Somebody wanted to pistons or something. We'd spend more time talking about different things and what was going on and that. And... Uh, no, I, I really meant to bring that into this. The Elva people were just turned out to be great people to work with. And it's continued to those of you who have brought them in recent years and that. It's the same kind of group of people that's really fun to be with and talk about the cars. So, Any uh, questions from the floor? I know somebody has a question. Yes, sir. There's been a rumor that one of you gentlemen owns the original... Elba that Mark Donahue had as a toy. Is that a fact or no? That it's what? Well, he owned it as a toy. He just liked it as a personal car. And he had an Elba that he sported around his home. Well, I'm aware of the Elba. You mean the courier that he raced no, or a different courier? One of the earlier models. That's I don't know one that he true. drove on the road. Well, it, as his biographer, that may be true, but I missed it if it's so. Sorry. Of his race car, uh, which I, I saw some photographs earlier somebody had of one that was painted up as Mark's original car, but I don't believe that is actually the chassis that he had because my understanding is his race courier, and I'm not sure about I don't know, nothing about a road courier, but his race courier sort of disappeared into the overall fabric of American racing as, as years went on before people realized that it was Mark Donahue's car. I know it passed on to a fellow whose surname is Gaunt, G-A-N-U-T, I think Robert Gaunt, who raced it for a while, but then it disappeared after that. Uh, that would be, uh, no, uh, he's from uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Gaunt? Yeah, Harry Gaunt. Harry Gaunt. Harry Gaunt. Gaunt. He's a, I deal with my wife's jewelers. Oh. Okay. <laughs> By the way, just one administrative note I was going to mention. There were some films here we didn't have a chance to show. They primarily show Susie Dietrich. Uh, they're from the... Susie Dietrich archive, and there's one actually that shows the British racing show of 1960, kind of a nice period piece. Those will be, is that correct, Michelle? We'll have those, uh, we'll have those rotating in the center as time goes on. And I want to put in a plug, another book to get is Michael's book, because you want, again, this idea of people and racing. The Formula One at Watkins Glen, 1961, 81, is a real treasure in that regard. Uh, I don't see any questions coming from the audience. I will say this about that courier. Let me just finish this point, Tim, and I want to get your question. Uh, that may be true that it went into the mist, that courier, but 
There are people who believe that car did exist. And when we had the Mark Donahue reunion here three years ago, that car was there. His son, Michael, drove it. And that car then was sold to uh, Johannes Willempart, who took it to Austria. And Johannes has an interesting hobby. In addition to a lot of great classic race cars, he also collects the first race cars of famous race car drivers, if you can imagine that. Tim. Excuse me. I understand the records were lost in a fire, so that's why I spent trouble getting, finding out about some of this. But if you have any just an estimate, like what the total number of sports racers, pure years, and pure years were like? Right. Um, I think the records lost in the fire might be somewhat, there, it seems like that happens a lot. The records are lost <laughs> in the fires, you know, and you're looking for, so I got a lot, I, I, yeah, I can probably write all chapter about records lost in fires. I think it was more uh, records lost because we don't want HM revenue to find out what really went on. That was probably more what really happened. But the records are really confusing with Elvis production. And the really the number one reason for that is not because of any skullduggery, but uh, because of unfinished, because you have kits coming out the door, you have finished cars coming out the door, you have some that were supposed to go out, kits came back in the door and were finished, sent out. So because of the nature of this kind of hodgepodge industry, that records weren't kept that closely. And then add to that these issues with the Dixon saga, the Dixon problem, recovery after that, Trojan coming into play. You have all kinds of, of opportunities for things to go awry and record keeping. I mean, that a lot to do. But to answer your question about the numbers, as best we can tell, there were about seven, eight hundred couriers built of all stripes, and this includes actually a, a handful that were built way after the um, the year of the Trojan era, because they, they hand Trojan then handed it off to a fellow named Ken Shepard, then handed it off to a fellow named Tony Ells, and they built a few cars after, just a handful, but the number eight hundred fits. Juniors, that's actually, the, the, I don't know the number in my head, but the junior and ap, ap, juniors happen to be the one that we're pretty well documented on, and it's right around 100 in total of the three different kinds of juniors, actually four if you include Scorpio. But the, um, I don't have that in my head, but I know that number is pretty concrete. The sports racers, in the neighborhood of three to 400, uh, some of those are pretty, like with the later ones, Six, seven, eight. We know the numbers exactly. Earlier ones, no, that's where we get in those kit car problems. Well, you, you raise a, a point there, and I'm going to ask both of you. Are you aware that there is a controversy that maybe there is someone in England or somewhere else who is manufacturing historic race cars and passing them off as Sterling Moss's car? And is anyone doing this with Elba? Is any clever mechanic who had built Elba's at one time are they manufacturing new ones that they're passing off? Uh, no, because Elvas aren't that valuable, after all. We, you know, we have this, this wonderful cult following of Elvas, uh, but they're not Ferraris. They're not. Uh, they're, that problem exists with Ferraris, Cobras, <coughs> Ford GTs, Coopers, Coopers. Yeah, yeah, Coopers to some. It, 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 it uh, Lolas. It, it happens with a number of. Some of them actually are licensed. Some, in some cases, like Lola, for example, now is licensed. What they call continuation, license somebody to build it, so those are legit. But then you get in this problem of, okay, they're built just like the old cars. Are they the same as the old cars? They're built with modern techniques and all. It gets into all these issues. Where it really, there's, I mean, there's a couple different problems with that. One is there is the, the fraud aspect where people try to pass off a car as having this and this provenance, and it really doesn't. And that happens over and over again. I've been involved in some, some of those cases, in fact. And then there is the other uh, kind of aspect, which is just like, well, we want to build this continuation, but now where are you going to race these things? Because the different vintage and historic sanctioning bodies, they have a wide variety of rules. Some are very, very strict. This particular car you race, the car itself must have documented history of having done X, Y, and Z. Other uh, sanctioning bodies are much looser. They'll say, we'll accept uh, cars that have been modified, modernized in some way. We'll also accept cars that have been um, built as a continuation. So those 
So there's an issue too of what you can do with these cards besides just what their particular provenance is. I got involved in a lot of this just recently because after I retired, actually my wife had done most of the uh, uh, the papers for historic cars and for the FIA in the United States. And uh, she wanted to continue doing that because she enjoyed talking with the people and so forth. And so when we retired, uh, my successor, Nick Craw, asked if we wouldn't continue doing that. And I said yes, but I didn't want to do inspections because I didn't want to travel. And we used Jeremy Hall, who was the uh, uh, FIA inspector that inspected all the cars for us. And we got involved in a number of those. We didn't have any problems that I can recall on, uh, on any Elvis at all, but we did have a lot of them on other cars. And the FIA had a procedure. They started out doing it for a uh, historic papers uh, called Heritage Program, and it was fairly expensive because it required the car to be, regardless of where the car was located, you had to have an inspector go out to it, had to go back, and generally it took a couple times to do it. And if there was any other car or any other person that claimed the providence of, of, of a car that you had, they would not accept either one of them until it was resolved. And it, it got kind of difficult. I actually have a Cooper still that I'm the only owner of the car. I bought it from uh, Reg Parnell, and he was the original buyer of the car. It was a race team, and I bought it from him. And it's been in my garage almost completely since that time. Yet we know of one in England that has is claiming the same numbers on it. You know the sad part: when these were first built, we didn't we didn't look into the things that you all look into now. We knew the cars because we knew it. It was a red Elva, and so and so owned it. And if he put a blue stripe on it, it was the red Elva with the blue stripe. Nobody ever asked about a serial number or anything. And it's, it's, it's really a shame that we didn't do more. But I think on the first Elvis we get, I remember the only thing I saw that had a number on it, and I'm not sure, it looked like a little tin strip that you'd get at an arcade for a quarter where you could print your name on a piece of metal or something. And I think Frank would go down to the arcade and get them made when he needed them. And, and it was really kind of funny. It's sad, but it makes it interesting, too. If it was all cut and dried and we knew where everyone was and everything that it had done, it'd be different. But it's fun. You know, there are people that, that save cars or, or collect cars just to do that sort of thing. They don't care about racing them or anything. They like to look at them, and, and they love enjoying the uh, history of them. And it's kind of fun when you find out your car had some kind of providence to it. It's, in, it's interesting, uh, just to comment on that, it's interesting about how the, uh, yeah, this thing about chassis numbers and so forth is, is an issue now because of the cars have become valuable. And then the, we, when you do dig through the history, there are all these problems That's come about for a variety of reasons that, that Bertie mentioned. And a lot, many of them have new legal issues back in the day because particularly before the onset of the European Union, crossing every border in, in Europe, you had to show that the car has yeah. left and entered the country. And so the documentation had to match the chassis number. But if you crashed a car, that means you still had to export that car. So you take the plate off and put it onto another car. That kind of switching went on all the time. And it goes on today. Um, I was, um, I call current racing quite a bit because of the writing that I do. And I was at, it was a, particular car in an ALMS race that was crashed at Lime Rock and a week later the next race at Mid-Ohio I was there and the team had this brand new car and uh, I went up to them I said oh I want to get the chassis number of your new car and the guy tells me the chassis number and I said no no that's the one you crashed last week he goes no no that's this one and I said no that can't be you've got a new car here he goes no we repaired it and I said, wait a minute, couldn't I? I was there at Lime Rock. It was badly damaged. It was destroyed. He didn't repair that car. He goes, no, we repaired it. And I said, no. But so these, and I looked, and sure enough, it had the same chassis number I saw a week earlier. And I said, well, how can I have the same chassis number? He says, well, we sent it back to Germany. They repaired it. They sent it back yeah. to us. 
It's a repaired car. No customs duties paid. Yeah. 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 Ah, Jürgen Barth, let me just tell you. you. Jürgen Barth told me that Porsche even did the same thing. They built a lot of race cars, team cars, and none of them had plates of their own. They just would move them from whatever they were taking <laughs> them with. And that's a company as big as Porsche. We have, we have a question. question back here. Yes. Yes, the name of uh, the name Sergeant shows Sergeant up. Prince was yeah, five thousand. Oh. Right. Well, he drove. I know he drove very successfully in the Continental Series at one time, and that I don't ever remember him in a Courier. And well, there were quite a few of them down in Atlanta, and it may be some place he worked or somebody he knew or something. But it's possible. The name very much rings a bell, and I believe he's in my database that comes with the book. So. We can probably take one here. Just yes, my story to be here. I may sure. Up there. sure, please do. We own a, Steve, inter, uh, Dave, introduce yourself. I'm I'm Dave Wild. We have an Elva career that I started racing after racing on MGTD for quite a few years. Uh, the Courier, we were racing uh, early 60s into mid-60s anyway. Um, this is a story that I never shared with my wife until many years later. Um, it had been raining for, oh, three days down here at Watkins Glen. And we, at that time, we're still doing standing starts. Um, the false grid was mud at that time, a curious mix of Watkins Glen clay and the oil leaks of a thousand British cars that had gone before. Uh, it was kind of a sticky mess at that time. They slowly put us out on the grid. And when the flag fell, I pulled a good starting position in the second row, staggered just behind a Porsche 356. Uh, the, as the flag fell, the 356 spun its tires, unloaded its load of mud directly <laughs> in my face uh, because we're sitting kind of exposed in an Elva Courier. Uh, it took me, well, Initially, I let off on the gas almost immediately, then instantaneously got back on it because I realized there were 100 cars behind me <laughs> at 100 miles an hour. Uh, we had to get moving, so I put my foot back down. I could not see a thing. Uh, I was trying to get enough water off the cowl of the car to clear the mud off my, my visor and was unsuccessful for a while. <laughs> Uh, but just on instinct alone and experience running the course there, I managed to come up from the old start finish line up the hill through the S's and out onto the straight before I could see again. So. <laughs> Great story. <laughs> Great story. <laughs> it was hairy. One other time I was up on the back straight and somehow or another it collided with a bird. It must have been a crow, because all I could see was black feathers. And it spun the helmet sideways to cover one eye, and it felt like a pterodactyl, not a crow. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Well, with that, I'm going to say very special thanks to Burdette Martin, to Janusz Wimpfen, and to all of you for being here Thank today for a great presentation.